Hi there. Today, a top 11 list of what I call TDE, or too damn expensive. Let me start by saying that some things are TDE, but worth it. For example, a heart transplant beats the alternative, pun intended. Most of us aren't made of money, but we're happy to pay for great hardware and software that performs as promised. For each item on the list, I'm going to say if I think the high price tag is worth it. With a simple yes, no, or maybe. Just in case someone is not familiar with the item, I'll also give a brief description of the item. I'll also let you know if I own it or have owned it. Coming in at number 11, the Neumann or Neumann U87. It's a large diaphragm condenser microphone. To call this a very popular microphone would be an understatement. Many artists looking to record in a studio won't even consider the studio unless it has a U87. As a set with the box and the suspension apparatus, this might cost a cool $3,695. Before I give you my vote, I want to add that I own one of these mics, so take that into consideration. Worth it? Yes, it sounds amazing. It's well made and it will last. It's an industry standard. At number 10, we have the Yamaha NS10. It's a near field studio monitor. The information I have is that Yamaha stopped making the original model in 2001 and there are new variants. I saw the originals in large studios in the 80s and 90s, usually propped up on either side of a large console, used as a set of second or third string monitors, subordinate to JBLs or Genelex. A lot of engineers loved them and still do. They were pretty famous for sounding like crap, but folks figured if you could make a decent mix on them, it would sound good elsewhere. Used classic pairs can go for a grand or more. Used newer versions go in the $400 to $500 range. Worth it? No, not for the originals. They simply don't sound that good and there are far better choices at a better price. Coming in at number 9 is the Oberheim Expander. It's a tabletop analog synth module with six voices lots of filter options, and five LFOs per voice. It's a baby brother to the Matrix 12. It gets my award as the scariest synth module. With three long green displays and military style push buttons, it looks like the control panel that John Connor will use to save us all from AI. They are hard to find and will run you in the seven to 10K range. Worth it? No. It makes very generic analog sounds that many modern hardware and software synths can reproduce easily. Certainly it makes fat sounds, but still no. At number 8 we find the Alesis Andromeda A6. It's a 16 voice analog synthesizer, albeit with a lot of digital control under the hood. True story. I was at the NOM show in 2002, and this synth was featured in the Alesis booth. I went up to one of the Alesis guys in the booth and asked him to play me something with some warmth, and he just stared at me. That was surprising to me. It's a good sounding synth, but the planet has circled the sun a bunch of times since 2002. There is tons of competition from many manufacturers like Dave Smith, Korg, Moog, and others. Worth it? No. Number seven, Sequential Profit VS. The VS stood for Vector Synthesis. It was Sequential's flagship that was going to save the company, a 61 note, 16 voice, sound mesmerizing machine. You can pick one up for six to $10,000 with a rack unit commanding higher prices than the keyboard version. About a thousand rack units and about 2,500 keyboards were made. It might have saved the company if it hadn't been for those meddling kids in Japan that Sequential was having financial problems and that most people couldn't figure out how to program the beast. About a year later, Yamaha purchased what assets remained. Like many synths on this list, 
you break something, good luck finding replacement parts. The velocity sensitive keyboard was notorious for failing, even when it was relatively new. If you're good with 3D printing, you might be able to keep it looking functional, but under the hood, it may be DOA. Worth it? No. It could produce some very unique sounds for its time, but it's not 1986 anymore. At number six is the Universal Audio 1176 Classic Limiting Amplifier. Let's just call it a compressor. This is a staple in many studios. If a studio doesn't have one, they probably want one or two, but perhaps it's not in the budget. You can pick up one of these mono channel beauties for a mere $2,599. You can buy hardware knockoffs for as low as 300 bucks or a software plug-in version for $29.95. Worth it? Maybe. It's hard to argue with so many professionals that swear by the 1176, and I'm not going to do it. Number five, Empirical Labs Distressor. It's a single channel compressor, so you're probably going to need two of them, if you're interested. With its black face and big white buttons, it's the tuxedo of your rack gear. One unit will set you back $1,549, or you can use any of the free compressors that came with your DAW. You can even buy emulations of famous compressors for 30 bucks or less. Worth it? Maybe. Like the 1176, it's hard to argue with so many professionals that swear by the distressor. Number four, the Eventide DSP 9000. This is a cute little effects processor from Eventide. Just kidding. <laughs> this is the big daddy of hardware effects processors, and it's a multi-channel effects processor. Think 16 plus channels, depending on if you've expanded it and it has a big daddy price. It will cost you $8,000 for a non-expanded unit with front panel controls, and $6,000 for the non-expanded unit with no front panel controls, meaning you control it via a computer. Pros love these processors, going back to the 3000 series and moving up to this one. And this one has most of the famous algorithms from the preceding models, which is a big selling point. Worth it? Maybe. Hardware effects, especially at this price and despite the multi-channel value, are a hard sell even to pros when in-the-box effects are getting a lot better. You could pick up a used 3000 series for a quarter of the price to get access to some of the famous algorithms and use unlimited instantiations of less expensive software in the box with all the box benefits. Number three, Roland Jupiter 8. It's an eight voice polyphonic analog synth and it's a beast. A little over 3000 were made they're not rare or hard to find, but they are expensive. You'll pay usually in the $20,000 range up to about $40,000 for a pristine version. Some have retrofitted MIDI. Worth it? No. They are neither rare nor musically unique. Even Roland offers a plug out and they and others offer software synth versions that sound incredibly close. At number two, we have the Moog Memory Moog Plus. This is a six voice polyphonic synthesizer that is essentially six mini Moogs in a polyphonic package. A true three oscillator per voice monster. For full disclosure, this is my all time favorite true analog synthesizer. Reasonably nice used versions of this synth can go for about $8,000. You can find a LAM version for about $25,000, which is a company that strips down and rebuilds the unit, making it a lot more reliable. Worth it? No. I love it, but it's TDE for what it does. There are far less expensive modern alternatives. 
Number one, and I don't think there will be any surprise here, is the Yamaha CS80. It's a synthesizer. However, to call it a synthesizer is like calling the SR-71 Blackbird a plane. So I'll call it an exceptional synthesizer. It has ho-hum specs of eight dual layer voices, a whopping 22 presets, and four user memories. You get two effects, tremolo and chorus, a ribbon controller, and a 61 note keyboard with per key aftertouch. It originally retailed for $6,900, and if you can find one, it will set you back anywhere from $50,000 to $80,000. They don't come up for sale very often anymore. They do sound amazing. You've heard it on the original Blade Runner soundtrack, Chariots of Fire, and others. There are a few software versions out there that can be had for a few hundred dollars. Many will argue, and probably successfully, that it's the performance aspects of this synth that make it so valuable. The polyphonic aftertouch, the huge array of front panel sliders and switches, and the monstrous ribbon controller. As modern day musicians, we appreciate 100% recallability. You play it into your DAW via MIDI and it spits it back at you identically. Not true with the CS80. It doesn't have MIDI, so if you don't record your performance with all those subtleties of control, you may not be able to duplicate it. Now the big question. Worth it? Originally I'd said no. But now I'm going to say maybe. It has a unique constellation of musical attributes. As I said in another video, I'd like my neighbor to own one so I could have some fun on it now and again and use it when I need it. But I don't want the chore of trying to maintain a synth that is pushing half a century old. In closing, I have a theory that I'd like to share about some of the very expensive classic analog synths in general. And I'd love to hear what others think. I believe that many of them go from studio to studio with synth floor perpetuating the desire in purchasers. After the person owns them for a minute or two, they realize that they're not that great, that they're very limited, and they quickly resell them. Perhaps the only folks holding on to them for any length of time are true collectors like professional musicians who can afford them. In closing, I could probably do at least three more top 11 lists in the TDE area, maybe even more. There is a lot of TDE equipment out there, most of it 70s and 80s cents. A lot of that just isn't worth the purchase price, and there are a few that are worth the purchase price. Hopefully I haven't wasted your time. Take care, and I'll be back in another episode soon.